It's really nice to, to be here. Jamie's been a friend for a long time, and as soon as he started talking about the conference, it was clear to me just what interesting people I would meet here and how much fun it would be. And, <clears throat> excuse me, my family's been here too, so I've taken a little time out to, to be with them, so I haven't gotten to, um, to be here the whole time, but it's just been fascinating for me. And my job today is really, actually I'll just come over here. Um, my job today is to just share with you, as an audience that loves science and is interested, one thing I don't think actually we do all that well at NASA is get the word out, so to speak, about what we do up in space. On, a, on the space station, we have six people all year long, every day of the year since uh, uh, for the past 15 years. We've had people living in space on the space station doing experiments that can't be done down here. And that's what I'm here to tell you about. But I think you need to understand sort of the whole picture and a little bit of context because I, I did spend six months on the International Space Station. That's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. And I also had two shuttle missions and some of you may have read about them. Hans, could we play the video? To this day, NASA has neither confirmed nor denied the validity of this transmission. The space shuttle has two radio channels. One is a public channel that we all hear when NASA is broadcasting. We can hear what the astronauts are saying. The other channel is a Department of Defense encrypted channel. And that's where I believe the real conversations are going on. The new millennium ushered in more UFO sightings by NASA shuttle crews. One extraordinary recording occurred aboard Space Shuttle Flight STS-73. Mission Specialist Catherine Coleman sees something curious on day three of the routine 15-day mission. This is October 21st, 1995. They have an unidentified flying object. And nothing after. I mean, there she is. Catherine's just floating around in there. And that's where I believe they went on to the Department of Defense encrypted channel on the space shuttle, and they continued the conversation. Researcher David Serena has been studying unusual phenomena in outer space for over a decade. It is his theory that NASA continued recording, but on a secret frequency, leaving us with more questions than answers. We have an unidentified flying object. Okay, so Hans, onto the slides. So we'll have to see. I think it'll all become clear. So, the International Space Station. I lived there from uh, December of 2010 until May of uh, 2011, so almost six months. I would have stayed another six months in a moment. I mean, it was just the most magical experience. And also, it takes a little while to get good at doing the work up there. And once you're up there and really in the mode of getting things done, and, know, and you know that the longer you spent up there, you're really efficient and you get a lot more done, it's really, really hard to leave. Um, this is my first crew. You know, we go up in groups of three. So there'll be there are three people up there, and then three of us join, right? And so now we're six. And so this is my first group of six. And I flew up with an Italian, Paolo Nespoli, a Russian, Dima Kondratiev. And uh, so there's, uh, there's Paolo, there's Dima. And then we joined um, Oleg uh, Skripochka and Sasha Kaleri and Scott Kelly. And Scott Kelly you'll see more in the future. First of all, he has an identical twin brother, Mark Kelly. And actually we were up there when Mark Kelly's wife, Gabriella Giffords, was hurt. And so that was a fairly traumatic time to be up there uh, together. Scott will be going again in uh, just about a year, I think. And he will be going for one year. And that's part of a very large suite of medical experiments to understand a lot more about what happens to people when they're up in space, because there's, there's a lot that goes on. So after a certain amount of time, around a couple months, Scott and his crew land, and they undock from the space station and land, and three more come up. And so that is uh, Ron Guerin from the US, and uh, Sasha Samakutayev, and Andrei Borisenko come up. And so that makes our group, our crew of six. So you're with a bunch of different people in, in sort of different ways. And this is a, about a three minute clip that just uh, shows a little bit about uh, launching and just being up there and, and just what it's like. Um, there's our two patches from the two crews. <clears throat> and I love this video because it looks like animation, like something that somebody made. 
but it's actually real footage from the space shuttle, just sped up just a little bit. And there's our space station. This is getting ready for launch. This is launch night, putting on our spacesuits. I sort of digress a little bit into training. You can see how small the Soyuz is. This is the Russian Soyuz. We launched from Kazakhstan with the Russians. We do a lot of our practicing there. About a third of my life for a couple years I spent in Russia, a third in Japan and Europe and Canada, and then a third in the US. And this is launch night. I'm waving to uh, Jamie, who is uh, now much older than you see in this picture. And my husband, Josh, is here as well, I'm doing pressure checks. Um, this is where I say to the guys, remember, short steps and slowly, and they forgot all about it. <laughs> If you see the whole film, it looks like Charlie Chaplin, you know? <laughs> and before you know it, you're uh, walking, they, they actually physically kick you off, and uh, you walk up the steps to, uh, to the rocket, climb in, and two hours later, you are on your way to space. It takes about eight and a half minutes from this moment until you are weightless. It's pretty fun. <laughs> And we, we spent about two days in the Soyuz itself, which is about the size of a small VW Bug or a smart car. And then we docked with the space station. We got up there right before Christmas. And, uh, and this is my favorite scene in the whole little video clip, even though it shows my butt. Um, <laughs> which is because it shows you it's not about floating around or climbing around in your hands. It is about flying from place to place. It's the only way to get around. It's living the life of Peter Pan. It's magical. It's easy. And I really loved it. And, if it, and I, I love what my, my uh, crewmate uh, Don Pettit says. He says, you know, if it wasn't, if I could take my family with me, <laughs> I wouldn't ever come home. So you can see I have very good hair. We were up there during, <laughs> in, I have good space hair. We made those origami because uh, we were up there during the Japanese tsunami. And that was a pretty traumatic time for our friends who had just sent the Japanese supply ship, which uh, earlier it showed me capturing with a robotic arm. And those white cranes represent hope and rebuilding for the Japanese people. I tell people that the only thing worse than doing math in public is doing origami in public. They sent 19 pages of directions. So this is the shuttle coming up. Mark call, initiating RPM. Three, two, one, mark. And that's the very last large piece of the space station to come up. And it came up in the, in the payload bay of the shuttle. And that's the docking ring you see right there. That video, again, doesn't really look real. And yet, it's because we're up in space, no atmosphere, and so the things are very clear. Discovery is initiating final push. Discovery is initiating final push. It's pretty fun when new people come up. But it's like a family. Of course, we all know each other back on Earth. Station in Houston. Discovery has cash to confirm. All right. Hello. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Install in the module. I'm going to go on and uh, just sort of segue here um, to just think uh, some facts about the space station. I mean, you can read them right there. You know, basically the, the bottom line is that it is big. It's like 10 train cars all strung together without the seats inside. And so when you're having great sympathy for the people up there, go and sympath have sympathy for somebody else because it's, it's, it's a giant place. You can be alone when you want to. You just can't leave when you'd like to. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you really had to, you would, uh, you would be able to leave. Um, we do uh, space, the, some of the more spacey kind of astronauty things that we do. We do spacewalks. We do robotics. Um, those are pr particularly important actually right now today. Um, as, as we speak, they're having a meeting down in Houston. We've had a problem on the space station on Friday night uh, where basically the, com the computer that controls the solar arrays and where they track, I mean, it, it actually controls a bunch of other computers. So this is about data. It's not about power, but it's about data. Where we have two of them, of course. There's a, main, and there's a computer that controls those things, and it, of course, has a backup. And as soon as something happens, that can, we, we default to the backup, and everything is fine. And then, you know, there's just computer glitches just like down here. And, and the solution to our computer glitches is often the same as it is down here on, on the Earth, which is you just power cycle, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, I laugh, but 
um, but it's true. There's often, there's little cosmic ray hits, there's different kinds of things that happen, and often rebooting or repowering or looking what's wrong or rerouting power and data, we can do those things. But in this case, the prime computer didn't come back up and doesn't seem to be functioning. And it's a box that's outside on the space station and it's easily replaced. It's what we've trained to do many, many times. We have about 14 sort of things that if they break, we would go out within two weeks and fix them because we don't want to be without that redundancy. And so one of those boxes, we call it an, an external multiplexer, demultiplexer, um, went belly up on Friday night. They spent the weekend trying to get it to come back up. It didn't. And so here's the, the question for the program is SpaceX, the, the supply ship, was supposed to launch tomorrow on Monday afternoon, bringing a whole bunch of important supplies, including food. We're actually a tiny bit low. Nobody's starving, but we're lower than we'd like to be and important parts for the spacesuits. You may have read that we had a problem this summer with Luca Parmitano's spacesuit, where we actually had basically a leak from the suit into internal in the helmet, and so he ended up with water on his face, and, and, and which was a very dangerous situation, you could almost say drowning in the helmet. We certainly have measures in place now. We have, there's some big long name for it, but we basically have um, a diaper in the back of the helmet, okay, for any water that does end up leaking out. I mean, it's, it's a really simple solution, and even a snorkel that's in there for breathing. It's like a straw. So we, we've we mitigated this risk, although we still don't fully understand it. It's probably contamination based and we're having to change out parts of the spacesuit. So those parts are on the supply ship. So what they're talking about right now as we speak is do we launch the supply ship because it has important parts for the spacewalks that, spacewalk that we now know we need to do. At the same time, if we do that, then when we're capturing the supply ship, there's a bunch of things. Everything is still working on the space station, but if the second box goes belly up, then we don't have the redundancy. And everything, a lot of things would still work, we just wouldn't be able to give them new commands. But there's a lot of things that we try to do when a supply ship comes up. We try to park in a certain kind of attitude towards the sun so we get the right amount of energy. So that's happening as we speak. And so um, as you look at my spacesuit um, there and think about these capture operations, this is a supply ship up there. That happens to be the Japanese one. I was the second person to catch a free flyer. Um, it, it's, it's a tricky business. And the reason they're having th that it's something they're talking about all the different possibilities and trying to make the best decision that they can is that it's not like when the space shuttle used to cozy up to the Hubble Space Telescope, grab it, put it in the payload bay, and repair it. Because if something went wrong and, and you knocked it or it kind of the Hubble lost its mind, the space shuttle could always move away and, and be safe. But the space station is the size of not just like a giant uh, truck but it's actually the size of a giant factory and we can't maneuver the giant factory fast enough to move it away if this decided not to be in control as it got even closer and closer to the robotic arm. And so um, this, is what, this is how we get our supplies these days from our commercial partners, SpaceX and Orbital Science Sciences and then our Japanese partners. Um, they all send supply ships. It's the new sort of way of NASA to be working with these commercial partners Doing thing, we're teaching them, and they're inventing also themselves in very great ways, um, to do things that we already know how to do. We know how to get people and stuff up to the space station. And once we know that, it doesn't mean that it's easy, but NASA has no business doing that. We need to do the things that are hard that we can't ask commercial companies to do. So we're in the business of transferring that to the commercial space companies, and that's actually my present job, is everything that we catch the robotic arm and everything that visits the space station, we call it the visiting vehicles. Um, every, all those things are what I'm in charge of right now. And <clears throat> excuse me. And it's been working really, really nicely where we've gone through the first flight of all these people's um, supply vehicles and now we're on the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth flights of the different ones. And so it's fairly routine, but it's still something where you want a lot of redundancy. And the thing that I tell the crews, uh, you know, the couple days when we have conferences before they're actually going to do this when I'm doing a little coaching is, is I remind them, okay, when that thing comes up in the window, it is big. And you know that little saying when it says objects in the mirror may be larger than they appear? I mean, it, there, is something, there is something that it's hard to um, actually tr tell people ahead of time is just how they're going to actually feel when it's not just an object in the simulator but something 
really big and scary and very close, like as close as you are to me is, is the distance that we capture, you know, right there in the audience. It's, uh, the capture point is, uh, it's, it's 15 feet away from the robotic arm, it's 30 feet away from the space station, it's close. So speaking of the robotic arm, I, I'm going to start into some of the developments that we have seen through science and through engineering on the space station. One of the cooler ones that's pretty new is the ability to, everything that went into building the robotic arms, there's several of them on the space station up in Canada, that's where they were designed. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, everything that went into that is now being used, they designed a robotic arm that could do surgery, neurosurgery, inside an MRI where you need to understand you know, what, what the brain is doing and, and be, able to see, be able to see actually you know, live performance and be able to do, uh, do surgery with it. And this is a clip uh, that Karen Nyberg made for me when I was trying to explain to people what I uh, showed Sandra Bullock. So Karen Nyberg was up on the station and I, tried, I talked to Sandra Bullock about two things. One was what it was like to live so far from everyone that you cared about. One wall to the next in microgravity. She even told her that you could take a human hair and use it stretched out to push against a, a wall or a handrail um, and it takes really that little effort. So since I have the resources, I thought I would give it a try. Isn't she awesome? Harder for the guys, some of them. So check this out. If you did it really fast, it'd just break. I mean, that's how little effort it takes to move. So the reason that I show you this is because, and there's the spacesuits in the background, you can see that so they'll be busy in the airlock here in the next week getting everything ready for those spacewalks. The reason that I show you this um, is because I, I'm now going to show you some about experiments and I want you to understand, you know, why we can do things up there that we just can't do down here. This picture actually says a lot of it. This is Andre Kuypers with a, just a drop of water in front of his face. You can see the, the multiple reflections. But we get to understand what do liquids really want to do. And the small, th small forces like surface tension are going to be the dominant forces. And this is a, a simple, simple experiment that we have where we you know, have liquid in a container and we've set up a video camera and it takes videos of what the liquid is doing. We do things like you know, turn, turn, maybe um, shake it, maybe uh, turn a vein to change the corner angle. Things like changing the angle of a certain shaped container by three degrees, the corner angle of by three degrees. You can't even see it, right? And that is all the difference between having the liquid everywhere in the container and having the liquid all in that corner. It's really interesting. And, and so we're understanding about these little forces that are tiny down here on Earth and hard to, to, uh, hard to study. Every, it, it affects everything that, goes, that involves flow through a pipe. So we understand a lot about flow through a pipe, except at the very edges. And that's where those tiny forces really make a difference. And so we're able to understand the tiny forces because they're larger than anything else going on up there with respect to liquids. And we can understand more about designing things down here on Earth. Things like um, uh, a lab on a chip involves capillary action, where you put a little tiny small sample of blood or whatever into a device, and then through capillary action, it needs to go to the different sensors on that device so you can, under so you can understand you know, how somebody's doing maybe out in a remote area where you don't have access to a lot of big facilities. And so understanding that capillary action is really, really important. And, and so that's one of the things that we could do up there. Another aspect of things is combustion. So basically we're understanding how to burn things, how to um, understand how soot is produced, um, how to burn things more efficiently, uh, understanding pollution better. Um, I'll show you this, this little video, a, a little slower than what we saw in the, um, you know, it might not go. You did see that, you saw that little video where the, the flame was round in the, in the movie, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Um, and, and there's no worries about that, Hans. It's just a really short thing. Um, so this one, what happened was you see a circular flame, and, and, and we all know the flame's going to be circular in microgravity because there's not the lighter gases being burned and going up, and then the new gas is coming in. It's actually a really, really energetic process. And measurements that we have to make in less than a second down here on the ground, in, micro, in milliseconds down here on the ground, to determine the slope of a line, those same measurements, less than a second, we can make over 30 or 40 seconds. So we're getting these data points to understand combustion. But even more interesting is after this thing burned, this little droplet of fuel, at I think the expected temperature was like 800, 800 degrees, there was a secondary ignition in a cooler flame that actually produces different ratios of products and maybe gives us some possibilities to burn things more uh, efficiently. So we're really able to see some of the more subtle aspects of the way things work. Protein crystal what, what I call your attention to here is what I say the ugly earth crystal and the beautiful space crystal. This is a, this is a, um, a protein crystallography map of that crystal. These crystals are actually almost water filled. They're very delicate and they're, they're lattices that are all held together. We, can, we build in general or grow in general more perfect crystals up in space. Not um, sometimes bigger, sometimes not, but almost always we can have some that are more perfect and that adds together with all the crystals that are grown down here to design drugs for diseases. And so this, this particular map is Duchenne's uh, muscular dystrophy. It's an agent that, it, that can inhibit, or has been shown to inhibit Duchenne's muscular, muscular dystrophy. And in having a more perfect crystal, we understood now that there was a water molecule in the lattice that we hadn't understood before. And for us, they're actually pretty uh, simple, uh, simple uh, experiments. And let's see if this guy's going to run. So what you would see is if, if, you, uh, if you actually saw the, the video is you would see all these molecules like this, okay? And they're slowly joining little, little matrices and attaching in all these random little ways until you see the one that's happening. Oh, good. So you can tell, now you can tell me if I did it well, okay? <laughs> So this is the really perfect ones, okay? So this is just showing you what a crystal really can look like. This is Brownian motion. So this is what I was trying to imitate. And Sandra Bullock taught me some things, so I think you'll agree. And you can see that some things, they're, you know, they're attaching, maybe in the right place, you know, maybe not. And now we're going to see what happens in space. Is that when you take away some of those extra forces, because of convection, and, and even just the heat that's given off, as each one of those things joins, there's a little heat given off, and so the, that, that's affecting how the crystal's grown. And so you can see that we're able to achieve a much more perfect lattice. Okay, thanks very much, Danny. That's the last one I'll make you do that on. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, magnetic behavior of nanoparticles and fluids, and you can see just by looking you know, from here to here to here to here, you're seeing more and more organization. If we tried to see that same organization down here on the ground, the nanoparticles would have already settled down to the ground, but here we can understand how do they orient together. And it, um, that kind of magnetically induced orientation is useful for probably things we don't even know, know about yet, um, but one way is in sort of stabilizing structure structures, like in um, buildings and bridges for earthquake protection, that might be a mechanism that we could use. These are, uh, these are little drops of drugs, okay? I wanna, I wanna create a picture in your mind of the way we do this. This is micro-encapsulation, an experiment that we did up on the space station, and it's to be able to have a drug, if you look at me for a minute, I think it's better than at the slide. Have a drug that's the size of my fist. Let's say my fist is here. It's, of course, very tiny. And now we're going to take a gun, a little plastic and co um, it's covering, or it's just like a little liquid plastic, and it's going to shoot a drop at this little drop of drugs. The little drop of drug is being shot out this way. It's going to meet this other drop, which is going to cover it. And our goal is to have the drop of the drug in a perfectly spherical, even coating, because we don't want our micro encapsulated drugs to have like a little thin part and a big thick part because we want a really even distribution of the drug as over over time for like time release. And 
the things that they learned in doing this experiment on the space station is they understood the order of magnitude of literally how much stuff to be shooting here and how fast and how to make sure that they meet here. And by what we did up in space, they actually have designed a process down here on the ground to be able to produce these microencapsulated, um, in this case, cancer drugs. And they've been shown in animals to actually be able to go directly to the, the, the source of the problem and reduce cancer in, I think it was uh, in mice, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. So I like this as an example of using the things we can learn up in space to then design a process where we're gonna really make things down here on the ground. We do a lot of plant growing, which uh, it helps us understand how to grow food for Mars, and there's going to be a talk later on today, which I think you'll find is a very interesting understanding uh, more about plants and genetically modified plants. Again, up in space, we're, we're looking at the very, very subtle mechanisms of growth that then feed right back down here, down to Earth, to understand how to grow things down here. We don't have a lot of time, we don't have a lot of energy, and we don't have a lot of resources up in space, and so we have to learn how to grow them more efficiently. Those kinds of mechanisms come straight, straight back down here to Earth to, have, to be able to be used for plant growth. And let's see. And this is a, a little platform that is off the, it's like a, a back porch on the space station. You'll be hearing more and more about this because it is the CubeSat deployment mechanism there. That, that is the back, the back porch of the Japanese module is what I call it. And from that, using the robotic arm, we actually pick up a launcher with the robotic arm, hold the launcher out at the right angle, and are launching satellites that are about four inches in, uh, in diameter. And so this is a way to, to do some practice launching, some practice satellites that are small, that helps us develop satellites down here on Earth. Um, working, working up there, there's a lot of things that are easy. This is my friend Don Pettit, and he's holding on a single finger, something that weighs probably about 150 pounds. <laughs> So it's really easy to, uh, to work up there, to learn things. Along the lines of our, panels yesterday, our panel yesterday, um, I went to the space station, or I started training for the space station, as somebody who knew exactly how to fix things. Because in my family, it was really easy. As soon as something broke, you picked up the phone, you called somebody, it was usually a guy, and they came over to your house and they fixed it. But it doesn't work that way on the space station. And I learned at the age of 50 that fixing stuff wasn't actually all that hard because there were tools. They weren't all that hard to learn how to use and, and they, people sent directions and I followed them and I fixed things. But you do have to make sure you have the right uh, accessories. These are my nuts and bolts earrings that I'm wearing. <laughs> and it's pretty fun. You know, all those places that are so hard, like when you're fixing your car and you're climbing under the sink and all those things, all that stuff is way easy and very fun up in space. And, and, and for the things that we know how to do, again, we're, we're trying to understand how can we do this easier so that we can use the human part of us, the, use our brains to be doing things that robots can't do. And so this is Robonaut. He has very, very dexterous uh, hands here. Um, I was taught how to, to repair his hands and, and how to train him. He came up during our mission, but actually we really didn't get to do a lot with him before I had to leave. Um, we did actually play a joke on all the, you know, all the robot scientists were pretty excited about Robonaut coming up, and so the night before he arrived on the space station, Paolo and I unpacked him hid him on the space station, put all 32 of those little bolts back on the box. I mean, the box was the size of a large refrigerator, right? You know? And then because they were so picky about it, they go, okay, you have to unpack it in front of the camera and everybody's got to watch. And we're like, okay. <laughs> so we were told, I, and I think it's like something, there's something on the internet about, I don't know, the top 15, badass things to do in space or something like that. And, I, and Paolo and I made the list, but we're told not to give up our day jobs for acting. <laughs> and so we are hoping that Robonaut can do things that for, in fact, this is a silly thing, just to, is, is taking the, the airflow measurement and you wouldn't believe how many variables there are and how you do that. And every crew member comes up with different numbers when they measure this thing and we all hate it, okay? And so they have taught Robonaut to actually hold the, uh, the uh, sensor device, at a, I mean, if you tell him 47 and a half degrees, that is where Robonaut is. 
and we've got some really neat robots that are that are coming up the line too, and some experiments for uh, controlling things with uh, uh, for satellite control to understand when you've got two like really big satellites out in space or more, how do we refuel them? How do we how do we have them you know meet up with the fueling module and and actually make that happen? What are the different ways that we could control satellites up in space? Well, we're practicing inside the space station using these uh, spheres. They're controlled with little CO2 cartridges just like we use down here. They're about this big and students are actually programming them and having them do, you know, have little contests. They're, so we have little robot contests up in space. And it's called spheres. It's a really, really neat thing. So on to health and how it feels and what happens to us. This is what used to happen to us is that you know the body really only does what it knows it needs to do and that is building bone and muscle. When you walk around it sends a certain signal to your brain or at least that's one of the theories to build bone and muscle. We don't do that up there and so we could lose our bone and muscle. We have, re we have designed an exercise device that Real, it's, it's, it's different than other exercise devices. Of course, we can't lift weights, but it's based on resistance. It can be programmed to do anywhere from six to 600 pounds. We exercise five days a week at least about an hour of light weight lifting, about half an hour of cardio. And I can't speak for other people's results, but I myself came back with all of the amount of bone and actually probably more muscle than I left with. Now, that doesn't mean that my bones are the same. Um, this, still might be the case where this is like the, the boneless chicken ranch, that far side cartoon. You know? <laughs> the aliens finally get somewhere. And uh, this is not the ones that um, I, were the subject of, ne never mind, okay. Anyways, so we do a lot of different medical experiments and a lot of those results come right back down here to the earth. They are fascinating. Just things like your heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump blood from your feet all the way up to your head. And so our heart muscles actually shrink and begin to resemble um, heart muscles that are aging down here. So there's things that we can learn about cardiovascular. When I watched Alice's talk earlier and you're doing all those tests, um, I understand that feeling, okay? Because we do a lot of tests and sometimes we don't do any better than the four-year-olds. So, <laughs> um, and we do some uh, interesting uh, neurovestibular tests. When we get up to space, often a lot of us are sick. Um, it just depends. I would say more than half are sick on my shuttle missions. I, I've like been not sick. I've been sick just a little. And on the space station, I think there is a certain part of your brain that when you get to this place where everything is different, you get up there and your body and your brain just go, oh, I'm back. And, and my crewmate, Ron Guerin, had a nice way of describing like coming home. There is an element of that sort of, you know, getting off a ship and, you know, still doing a lot of compensating like this or bent down from the ski slopes. But uh, it, it, for us, it happens in a more violent way. And at the same time, when someone hands you a bottle of water, if you've been up to space and then been home again, if you've already had that transition once, when somebody hands you a bottle of water, your brain is already understanding, hey, I'm back in the other place where everything is heavy and gravity sucks, right? <laughs> uh, the food, a little bit about food. <laughs> Um, this is what our dinner table looks like. Everything has to be Velcroed or held down by bungees. And to the computer also by internet. So even if the food looks bad, tastes bad, <laughs> it is very fun. But we are finding out uh, through our studies there, because, because things happen so quickly to us up there with respect to bone loss, um, what a 70-year-old woman who has osteoporosis loses in a year, I would lose in a month. So 10 times faster. It makes us very good subjects so that we can actually measure through urine and blood and other different tests, can actually see osteoporosis happening and, do, and also do a lot of work to understand the mechanism. And one of the things that we've been finding out is that vitamin D uh, seems to be very, very important in terms of strong bones and muscles. And our findings on the space station um, played into the report which recommended that all North Americans take uh, more vitamin D. Um, just a little bit about, it. I know that your kids are going to want to know about the bathroom, so, um, but it's all about a big fluid physics experiments, right? So that, that is for peeing everything, it's like a vacuum cleaner, right? But not like a vacuum cleaner, just like a little breeze, everything goes where it needs to go. But then for everything else, I did actually at first do this demonstration with granola bars, but it just was not a visually appealing experiment. <laughs> 
And this just shows you that we've got a toilet and everything goes where it needs to go. But again, this is science and engineering at its best. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, we, we, we actually use these things all the time, or excuse me, we use these principles all the time. You know, our toilet up on the space station, we recycle all that urine and drink it literally the next day. Uh, Don Pettit likes to say it's uh, yesterday's coffee today, you know? <laughs> The same, um, the same filtration systems that we're using have turned out to be very good uh, systems for places where clean water is a problem. And so these results are coming back down to the Earth. And at the same time, in terms of being ready to go to Mars, it's these same systems. It's recycling the air and the water. These things break all the time up on the space station. If you look on the website, you can see it. And it's not because stupid people designed them or didn't take the time or didn't realize that they're important. It's because we're learning things that we need to know about how, how it really works, uh, how, how things crystallize up in space and just things that are different in microgravity. Um, we also do some cultural experiments. This is a Japanese uh, LED uh, just object that they had us spin in different ways and take uh, movies of. I have to say the Japanese are very far ahead of us in this respect in that they manifest and pay for and schedule time for cultural experiments that they think, they say experiments, but cultural activities that I think are really, really important. On the US side, we do them in our spare time. This is my friend Dan Burbank, and that is, Jan and that is James Taylor on the right. And so Dan's in space playing guitar uh, with James Taylor, and they're playing actually together. So I'm a flute player. You're looking at me. Jamie has given me a, a thought. Is that a five or did? Uh, yeah. But you did it three times. Does that mean I have 15? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you, you can see this on the internet, but I, I'm a flute player and I took flutes from Ian Anderson of the band Jethro Tull and the Chieftains. Uh, it's my way of sharing you know, my world with, with others. And so I brought their flutes up to space and Ian Anderson put together this really delightful uh, flute duet where I'm playing, he's playing, we're playing together. And actually the anniversary of that was just yesterday. So four years ago yesterday was the anniversary of human space flight. When I was up on the space station, it was the 50th anniversary of human space flight. And when, and just last night, yesterday, was the 54th anniversary of human spaceflight. And Jethro Tull uh, was playing in Russia at the time, and so uh, there's greetings in Russian and in, in English, and music, a duet between Earth and space, which I think is pretty neat. Oops. Wow. So we'll just see the first few seconds here, and then you can hear it on the internet. One take, that part. I was very proud. <laughs> Um, I was nervous actually. It's interesting to do things that are outside of your comfort zone. And so at the end here, just a few pictures of the Earth from space. Uh, these are your pictures. Every picture that we take up there is public domain, okay? And, uh, and, and everything we say is, is public domain as well. The secret communication channel. Anyways. Um, <laughs> this is our window that we take those pictures from. And I, on our mission alone, we took 60,000 pictures. This is my friend Don. And, and all these cameras just float and you use this one, and then you put it back, and this one, and they all just kind of stay in the same place. It's really fun. And so this is just pretty neat to see. OK, so can you see Long Island, New York City? That's Cape Cod out there. And so now all the way down the East Coast, and then you're looking out towards the Great Lakes. Isn't that just awesome? There it is in the light. So it's easier in the winter. This is the Hudson. I took this picture. So this is the Hudson. My, so we live, Josh and Jamie and I, um, right up here in, uh, in Shelburne, Massachusetts. And I, I, I work full time in Houston, but I, I live, uh, live there with my husband and my son as well. That's the Quabbin. That's always my landmark. And of course, uh, Cape Cod. Um, a guy that I flew with on my first mission from Massachusetts, he, we saw New England from space. And he looked down and he goes, oh my god, it looks just like the map. <laughs> so I show 
you a series of them just to share a little bit about sort of the, the feeling of being up there and the point of view and how it's always different. And then here we are, right? So I want to say that we're like right in here somewhere. Yeah? I know all you New York, New York people know it better than I do, but you know, so we were watching. All the things you do, we are watching, okay? <laughs> And Aurora, so I'll just flip through these pretty quickly because you've gotten the idea. And, and if you look at the look for the astronauts' gateway to photography, you're going to see some of these things. And up close, I think is fascinating as well. Where this is the uh, Patagonia and glaciers. There's that. See the um, impact crater there? Got a series of impact craters. Again, in the winter, it's easier. It's in the desert. Uh, volcano, uh, Kuril, I think it was in Kuril, right north of Japan, Bahamas, a comet that Dan Burbank happened to catch, looking out the window, saw this thing, took a picture. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it's like the, the universe in a movie, but it's not animation. And these pictures now are Don, my friend Don Pettit, and if you look up uh, Saturday Morning Science, he's just one of my favorite astronaut people, and he just he does things like he's the one who brought cities at, uh, cities at night to us from space because he figured out how to program the drill that we had up there so it would rotate at the same speed as our speed over the Earth. I mean, I thought about that, okay? But, you know, I just, I was busy playing the flute, I didn't do it. <laughs> This is not a photograph, but it's, uh, we have some telescopes that are mounted on the outside of the space station showing us uh, black holes and, and showing, uh, showing us all sorts of things. Um, out, they're looking both down at the, at the Earth and also out into space. And, uh, and I'll just, let, let's see, That's a, my, one of my favorite pictures is not me, but my friend Tracy who is up in space, uh, who was up in space and took that picture. I think it's the epitome of uh, what it looks like, what it feels like to be one human uh, going around the Earth. And I just wanted to show a little bit about what it feels like to come home. You know, that we showed all these Earth pictures as if that's the only perspective that you need, but in some ways it made it more significant to come home and, and then be part of the view. This is my family. And, you know, all of us, I mean, if you're here at this conference and your kids are not here with you, then somebody is helping with your kids. All of us, you know, have a partner in some way, or I hope we do, because it's a lot of hard work raising kids. And, as, you know, when you heard Alice talk this morning, it's just really, really important uh, to, to bring those kids up. But it does take, at least for me, a village. This, my husband is a, a glass artist, and uh, my son, Jamie, a few years ago, and his trusty cat. And you do get to bring some special things up to the space station. I told you that my husband is a glass artist, and these are some of his work. People give us a hard time because, you know, he makes planets. I like to go around them. But it's really, I think that everyone explores in different ways. And I'd like to, to leave you with that, because I think every one of you here explores in a, in a certain way, in that you take people in, in, in writing your blogs, in asking questions, in starting conversations, you take people to a place that they can't go by themselves. They wouldn't have gotten there, and you take them someplace new, and then they bring themselves to that situation. And so I think what you're doing here today and yesterday at the Skeptics Conference and in the, in the podcasts and in the, the conversations that go on, they're really, really important because we're here on the Earth, but it's a very, very large universe. All of us are space travelers. It's just that some of us got, we're lucky enough to leave the planet uh, once or twice. So thank you very much.